All right. So essentially the work I'm presenting here is uh, an effort to determine the uh, feasibility of using distributed acoustic sensing instrumentation for the for design of uh, future tsunami early warning systems. Um, this uh, this work is uh, essentially a collaboration between uh, Joe Asur here in um, the south of France and the University of Alcala in, um, in Spain. So um, essentially, uh, well, tsunami observations are mm, mostly made by uh, coastal tide gauges, fixed moorings, buoys located offshore. These, uh, these buoys typically, as I'm illustrating the diagram down here, they typically uh, transmit data from uh, pressure recorders located on the ocean bottom. And uh, these systems uh, relate the information to onshore um, data processing centers. Uh, so, and, and they're typically recording the, the, uh, the pressure variations from uh, overhead, um, overhead waves passing directly over the sensors. Uh, one such systems on a global scale are the dark buoys that I'm uh, illustrating up here. However, um, these instruments are only able to provide early forecasts for uh, far field tsunamis due to the, you know, to the sparse um, sensor density or the, and their limited spatial footprint. Uh, and it would be best to deploy instrumentation directly over and around offshore locations, such as active plate margins, subduction zones, where most uh, destructive tsunamis tend to be generated. And um, it is for these reasons that the idea of leveraging the location of transoceanic cables, as many of you guys are familiar with this um, map down here I'm illustrating, uh, introduces um, um, a very desirable um, uh, sensor distribution on a global scale. Um, so introducing that instrumentation in the future of uh, tsunami early warning systems is uh, very appealing. Uh, proposition. So it has been proven many times over that um, um, that instrumentation is very much capable of the term of uh, detecting longitudinal deformation of uh, fiber fiber cables. Uh, what I'm showing here is just the, the the definition of strain, which is the the difference in velocity or displacement over a over a predetermined length. And uh, down here, I'm showing the noise curves of a standard DAS uh, instrument, along with the white uh, with the noise uh, uh, the noise curve for a new version of an improved uh, DAS instrument with an improved uh, performance on the low frequency regime. Um, and I'm also uh, highlighting the tsunami spectrum that we're interested in in uh, detecting. Typically, instruments always show a uh, one over f noise, where the where the noise tends to increase with the decrease of frequency. This is a uh, almost a uh, um, um, it's a characteristic of most instruments that uh, typically they show this this uh, um, this signature. Let's call it of the one over f noise. Um, so, given that we're mainly interested in tsunami signals, um, when it comes to detecting tsunami waves with DAS, we're mainly concern, uh, considering these three sources of, uh, of strain on the cable. One is the, the Poisson effect of the cable, so that's just the, the deformation due to uh, vertical uh, pressure impinged on the, on the cable and the um, longitudinal elongation it produces. The other effect is the seafloor compliance effect. And uh, the third one is the shear, uh, shear strain due to the traveling tsunami wave passing, passing overhead. Uh, so for, so as far as the Poisson effect um, is concerned, we, um, I started by uh, looking into, into the literature for the uh, typical Elasticity and uh, and properties of the cable um, of the cable assembly. Um, there are some um, in broad terms. There are some uh, agreement with the uh, typical values that are given for Young's modulus or the Poisson ratio of, dif of uh, different compositions of fiber. Sorry, uh, of cable that is used for underwater applications. Um, 
after, after a few consultations and a reading a few um, of the of the technical specs of uh, cable manufacturers, we typically um, typically uh, arrived at these ranges for Young's modulus between fifty between five and fifty gigapascals, smaller values for less armored or more flexible cables, and um, new being the Poisson ratio being in this um, this uh, this range. As for the seafloor deformation or the compliance effect in the seafloor, uh, given that the, that uh, according to the long, to the <clears throat> to the wavelength of uh, of wave uh, ocean waves that we're uh, monitoring, um, that kind of determines the 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 depth of the um, the depth of uh, penetration of the of the effect on the seafloor. Uh, it's a uh, research done by uh, Crawford. Um, it's, it has been determined that the, the penetration it's uh, one over two pi or one over fourth of the of the water wavelength under consideration. And just for um, to keep things in a more broad general general terms, we uh, we've been implementing the prem model, and uh, we're just using the uh, the elasticity coefficients based on a. Uh, on the wavelength of the water water wave uh, that we're under consideration, and here I'm just showing a typical um, velocity profile and the and how the compliance effect tends to uh, tends to vary accordingly. This is just the the range of frequencies where the compliance effect uh, is more um, prominent in the data sets. And here I'm just showing some uh, preliminary results. So what I'm showing here is the the pink curve is the the noise floor for the um, let's call it the uh, the new version of uh, DAS instrumentation with uh, better performance the low frequency regime. And the different color curves here illustrate the the different strain levels at different um, different water length uh, water depths. Uh, this uh, this simulation only includes both the both the Poisson and the compliance effect on the cables. So this is for the water displacement of a, a water um, uh, uh, amplitude of uh, or a water level displacement of ten meters. Sorry, ten centimeters, and this is for one meter displacement. So as we can see over here, that we're pretty much still below the below the noise floor for the for the DAS instrumentation, whereas for a one meter displacement, which would be a very significant um, uh, water displacement at the origin of the tsunami, uh, we seem to be in a more or less of uh, an okay position. Uh, there has been some uh, previous discussions as uh, other means that could be implemented um, to further improve the performance of the instrument. So that's uh, uh, that's still under under uh, under study currently. Um, the other source of uh, strain we're also looking into is the is the shear strain on, um, caused by the traveling tsunami wave, and the 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 interest in this really came upon noticing that the the vertical vertical displacement or vertical particle motion tends to decay as the uh, with depth. However, the horizontal displacement tends to remain. More or less uh, stable throughout the throughout water depth. Um, so, using some data that was provided by the by uh, this publication from Tanaka, uh, and using these um, uh, initial uh, conditions, uh, we ran just a quick simulation where we determined the strain levels uh, from from point zero, which is the the tsunami origin point, all the way down to the coast. So this is already uh, at the shore. So we noticed that uh, the strain levels tend to increase or we become more considerable or significant, much, much closer to the coast. So this probably illustrates like uh, around the last 30 or so kilometers, uh, we would be able to somewhat detect any signals. As, uh, as the depth, as the depth uh, with, with uh, higher depths, the, it becomes uh, the, 
this source of strain becomes less uh, uh, becomes essentially negligible. This is still I'm still working on a model that would incorporate this to the to the previously shown data here. So this is only this is only considering the um, the strain due to vertical displays or the vertical pressure on the seafloor. Now, um, at the moment, we're considering a few data sets to corroborate or to implement the model. Um, to our knowledge, there's no um, DAS data set that, it, that contains a tsunami, um, a tsunami signal. Currently, uh, we're, we're, we're using a, a full physics simulation of the Tohoku earthquake magnitude 9. We're also using uh, data that was provided from a cabled observatory that captured the Tokashi earthquake and tsunami from uh, 2003. Uh, we also ran a quick simulation uh, of the Indonesia subduction zone and the megathrust that uh, has been recorded tsunamis there as well. No DAS data, but uh, we uh, we simulated uh, two arrays located off the shore of the of the, um, this Indonesian island. Uh, we also have uh, we also been studying a generic scenario where we have a, a mega thrust and tsunami. We simulated uh, uh, the location of uh, of a series of arrays that would detect uh, that are essentially seismometers. Uh, and finally, we're also using data from a from a DAS array located off the off the southern coast of uh, France, at the city of Toulon in France. Uh, at the very end, there's um, there's a couple of pressure gauges we're using to to correlate or to corroborate the data observed. As far as the the data provided for the Tohoku magnitude nine earthquake and tsunami, uh, this data was provided by uh, by the group in Stanford from uh, from Eric Dunham. Uh, here, the data provided uh, it includes the nucleation of the earthquake, propagation of waves, as well as the water column displacement. So we see. We see the slip velocity incrementing at about 50 seconds, which corresponds to the horizontal seafloor displacement and the, and the eventual sea surface height um, variations. So we clearly see two, uh, two beams that are the propagating tsunami heights. Uh, from the data provided, we're so for example, from seafloor displacement, we're able to calculate uh, strain due to the seafloor deformation. This is just the, the uh, finite difference between adjacent channels. And uh, we calculated the, the strain due to seafloor uh, pressure changes, um, both from the, from the Poisson and the seafloor compliance effects. Immediately, we see about a two to three order magnitude difference of the strain calculated for both events, uh, which is uh, which is to some extent uh, to some extent this is a somewhat expected result um, from the seafloor displacement uh, from the pressure difference uh, signals. We're also able to 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 detect the tsunami signal near the near the origin. From here, we're able to determine or roughly estimate the tsunami propagation velocity. Um, this is only using the um, 200 and, 220 kilometers offshore from the coast. So this is only using uh, just a few channels off the coast. Uh, should also be mentioned that the seafloor deformation data was uh, low pass filtered, so we can uh, more clearly see the different um, uh, the different speed, the different wave was traveling at, at about this time. Uh, for the Tokashi data set, um, so this data consists of uh, accelerometer data based on OBS, OBSs 1, 2, and 3, as well as uh, a couple of pressure gauges, pressure stations, PG1, PG2. Um, so here I'm just trying to do a side-by-side -side comparison, which is not exactly fair because the, the data on the Tohoku uh, simulation had about a spatial resolution of about 170 kilometers, whereas the separation of the of the OBS stations are uh, a few uh, about a 20 kilometer separations. But uh, we we can more or less do a do a comparison of the data data between uh, 
between the horizontal displacement and the and the strain the to see floor compliance, we still see a two order magnitude difference between between both uh, uh, both data um, compared side by side. If we try to compare both the uh, the data sets from Tohoku and Tukashi only due to seafloor deformation and the Poisson effect on the cable, which uh, is a slightly more um, uh, has a slightly higher magnitude than the than the compliance effect. And if we actually stack the signals of the Tohoku data set to make it comparable to the kilometer separation of the Tokashi OBS stations, um, they are somewhat comparable um, in, in uh, quality of the signal. Uh, as far as the, the signal due to the pressure variations, we clearly see the, the signature for the tsunami here. Whereas for the Tohoku data set, it's a bit difficult to uh, to have the resolution because the the Tohoku data set was only about 500 second length, so uh, definitely needed a little more time to to have a better a clear resolution of the signal. Here I'm just doing a comparison with the noise floor of the DAS instrument with regards to the to the signal due to the seafloor displacement, which is the green curve up here. And the signal do do only to the uh, due to the pressure to the Poisson effect on the on the Tohoku data set. So somewhat similar to the uh, to the previous uh, graph I showed earlier, the the signal due to due to only vertical uh, vertical pressure is uh, essentially at or near the 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 noise floor of the instrument. Uh, this is just a quick uh, overview of uh, of some essentially some comparisons I'm trying to do with the uh, stacking channels near near the location of the of a pressure of a pressure station located at the end of the of the DAS fiber. So here I'm just uh, trying to ascertain some correlation between what we have here is two pressure uh, two pressure gauges illustrated by the blue continuous curve and the dashed line here. Uh, the orange orange line is the stacked channels uh, on the DAS cable. This is showing about uh, thirty meters of stacked channels. This is about two hundred uh, yeah two hundred meters, and this is about half a kilometer here stacked. Um, so we definitely see a, a change in uh, trend behavior and uh, and the general um, waveform of the data. So this is very much still a work in progress. Um, so as for the the data set for the for the generic mega thrust and an eventual tsunami uh, from this uh, from a simulated earthquake, here what was simulated is a magnitude eight point five earthquake. With the with the fault having these characteristics outlined here, um, and the simulation it was a uniform two kilometer water depth. Uh, this simulation was carried out by a by a group in uh, in LMU in Munich, Germany, uh, using a supercomputer. Uh, the the spacing of the the spatial sampling is uh, I'm blanking out on that, but I I believe it's about uh, three hundred meters uh, per station. So this is just some preliminary results. Uh, so here I took I took the array passing right through the middle, uh, roughly. I don't know if you guys can see the mouse, but uh, roughly in the middle is the is the subducting slab. And what I'm showing here is the horizontal displacement data provided by the by the simulation, and the and the calculated horizontal strain. So this is just essentially, as described earlier, this is just the differential difference between neighboring channels and, uh, and doing the integral as uh, to calculate strain from, to get it from strain rate to strain. And this is uh, the, the, the strain due to the pressure variations uh, obtained on the seafloor. Uh, same observation again. We do see uh, a better one or two order magnitude difference of the of the strain levels uh, being estimated. Oh, and uh, for the moment, I believe this is what I have to show.
And I guess I'll hand it over to my colleague, Julian. Okay, thank you, Carlos. I seem to have a problem with um, sharing my screen. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Well, so um, I'm also going to present to you something um, also um, related to, let's say, low frequency signals. Um, but I'm going to focus more on the temperature effect that um, it's uh, notice on, on DAS data. So I'm also at the same institute as, as Carlos. Um, this, this work that I'm going to present to you, it's uh, like I've been um, done in collaboration with Anthony Sladen and Oli and Ponte, both researchers in France. And uh, just a very rough summary of what I'm going to talk to you about uh, today. So it's about uh, distributed acoustic sensing. Uh, implemented on seafloor cables to study ambient temperature and the potential that it can have in, in ocean sciences. So our motivation came from, well, mostly from, from this publication. It was uh, from uh, Ide and his colleagues, where they observed very interesting signals over a couple of days. This is offshore Japan. Uh, here you see a vertical axis, uh, the distance, and here in the x-axis, the time. And, and yes, they see some signal with some semi-diurnal periodicity, which they relate to um, interaction between uh, currents, uh, tides, and, and complex uh, bathymetry. So uh, we wanted to test, we can see the same in, in our data, because we also have some data here in, in cables nearby. And to try to test, we can also relate this uh, safely to a temperature signal. Um, if you go a bit into the background of this kind of studies, uh, you see that there were already some publications uh, related to uh, the use of fiber optic sensing, not DAS, but uh, distributed temperature sensing, Raman technique, um, for oceanography and, and hydrology. So um, there's a lot of, there are quite a few studies um, detailing this kind of signals. And as you can see, um, and they show quite similar patterns as we saw in the, in the previous slide. So um, um, we're gonna kind of, uh, we try to do the same with, yeah, with DAS. So you already are familiar with DAS. I, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but um, yeah, you know, all the capabilities that DAS can offer. And um, what I want to focus on right now is about uh, what um, DAS is actually measuring. So, um, but uh, most systems, uh, well, the traditional systems uh, that are used in, in the community use is the phase OTDR, optical time domain reflectometry, which is sensitive to ch changes in phase of the of the backscatter light that's sent along the along the fiber. So this can be represented as a modulation of phase caused by um, uh, elongations or compressions of the fiber and also uh, by changes of uh, the refractive index of the fiber itself. So if you just consider the temperature effect, this is what we are interested in here right now, um, you, you can translate this into uh, um, extensions or compressions uh, on the fiber caused by um, thermal expansion of the fiber itself. And what's uh, termed the thermal optical effect on the fiber. And the, the values of this thermal optical coefficient um, tend to be uh, much higher than those of the thermal expansion. So it is suspected that uh, if there is a temperature signal that is affecting dust, it's going to be dominated by this effect. However, this may change, um, vary depending on the cabling type, for example, uh, armoring, uh, you know, coating, etc., and, and other factors. So. These are just um, at least um, a rough expectation. And this also implies that we have, um, as, as you, some of you may know already, we already can estimate um, a very simple transfer function between the, um, the temperature uh, changes that are measured by dust. 
and the um, and the uh, and the strain that's uh, natively natively measured. And it turns out that this this idea is actually dates um, to to um, a couple decades ago actually. So this was already proposed. So, so, potential method to study temperature using rayleigh based systems like that. Um, and it actually has some advantages over DTS sensors. I'm going to talk to you a bit more about this later. And uh, well, as you may know, the, the, the other physical fields that can be measured by DAS. And also the fact that uh, DAS is an um, expanding community right now. There's uh, a lot of interest around DAS. So uh, it may have uh, some potential to grow faster than other technologies. At least, at least in, in the fields of, of geophysics. So uh, I'm going to show you, to you uh, some um, results on some data that we acquired on one of the cables that the Carlos showed. It's in south of France, in, in Toulon. So we have uh, this um, this cable here, and um, basically this is the kind of signal that we uh, uh, detected um, for uh, almost uh, 15 days of data. This is for the for the shelf here. The x-axis is time, and uh, the y-axis is um, the distance. And here, the, sh the short should be here in this part here above. Um, and you can see very nice patterns that uh, resemble, to some degree, those that we, we saw before. Um, you see a very non uh, non stationary signal, and that's uh, kind of progressing outwards towards, let's say, offshore, and then moving back, retreating over time, and maybe here disappearing a bit. If you look at the same kind of signal for the slope, this is uh, between um, about uh, 100 to, to 2,000 meters depth. You see also interesting patterns. They seem to be uh, uh, also kind of linked somehow to the bathymetry itself. Uh, as you see here, for example, some channels tend to behave in a consistent manner. And, and somehow the signal is a bit more, let's say, more uh, regular, more steadier than, than the one that you see here above. So, um, and also here in this, this part, which is the, the deep ocean, and then you see um, that uh, the noise of the instrument starts to dominate. Mm. But we have confirmed with other uh, data that we have from, from a different cable that it's actually possible to see some very similar signal in, in the in the stable flat seabed. So it's um, probably a limitation of this particular experiment. And so here I just assume of, on, on some of the, the dates um, of the last slides. So uh, just to show you a bit more in detail how these signals look like. Very, very interesting uh, patterns as we see here. So um, basically, um, if you, if you um, look at the same kind of signals, but uh, you differentiate them in time, maybe it's easier to understand a bit uh, what they mean. So here's yeah, basically the same with the, the time derivative of, of both. And um, yeah, the red here means an increase in value and, and blue means decrease. You can notice how um, there's this consistency of, um, of uh, increasing and decreasing anomalies, like this B pattern that you see here. And this is also in, in the slope. You can see it in some parts, like here, for example, or here. So um, if we go by the fact that this is uh, related to um, temperature signals in the ocean, it, it makes sense. Um, well, also based on, on the previous observations that uh, what we're seeing here is a vertical um, oscillation of a thermal gradient in the ocean. It means um, uh, that the um, temperature is a very, uh, let's say, um, yeah, a marked temperature uh, change in the, in the water column is being affected uh, vertically um, in, in a very regular way. And this is something that's known to, to be the case for uh, internal waves, which actually basically um, moving up and down the, the internal structure of the, of the water, especially along uh, these strong gradients. 
So we wanted to also see um, what else can we can we learn from this. I mean, uh, here you can see the apparent speeds of these anomalies. It's, uh, they're actually quite small, uh, one to 10 centimeters per second. But we also wanted to, to see what's the, the spectral content of the signal. So that's, that's what we did here. So we, we, this is the average um, spectrum. It's not a traditional spectrum. It's actually um, a hilbert mann transform spectrum you can obtain through empirical multi-composition. And um, you can actually see that there's uh, a lot of energy clustered here around uh, this um, 17 more or less hour period, which in, terms, in turn corresponds to the inertial frequency of this study region. So the, the um, this would be the inverse of the inertial frequency of, of, of the, the location, which, which is dependent on, well, for once, the, the vorticity of the Earth, two times the, the spin rate, and also the, uh, the latitude that we are at. So it's a very uh, good correlation that we see. So it uh, makes us think that uh, one of the types of signal that is dominating um, this, this observation is uh, near inertial internal waves. So uh, when, when you also see the, the, the frequency wave number spectra of both locations, you also see some interesting uh, patterns here. For example, in the shelf, you can see um, what looks like um, um, model propagation. You see the two, two branches of energy in the, in the onshore, which should be the, the, the right side of, this, of each of these figures. So it's an onshore component. It's uh, quite uh, dominant. And also you can see here um, some dominance on the, of the, around the, the needle inertial frequency that I just mentioned, which is the 17 more or less hour period. And in the, in the shelf, you see a bit, a bit more smeared spectrum and it's uh, maybe also caused by the fact that um, the, the cable is not actually linear here, but it's actually, um, there's a lot of bathymetry, irregular bathymetry. So the horizontal projection of the cable, it's uh, horizontal, but uh, vertically it's uh, changing. So yeah, it's a bit more difficult to interpret. So just a very brief, um, let's say a, a couple of interesting points about the uh, internal waves um, to have an, uh, a better idea for those of you who are not so familiar. Um, so internal waves basically um, are um, waves um, that uh, they develop in the interior of the ocean and they are um, being, um, let's say, controlled by buoyancy forces, but, but also by Coriolis forces. So buoyancy controls them more in, in the high frequency end, and Coriolis tends to be dominant for uh, longer periods, right? And these are caused by um, perturbations of the ocean in general. So for example, atmospheric fluctuations, um, cyclones, for example, that can generate a, a low pressure anomaly over the ocean, tends to um, um, pull up the ocean, some regions. So it disturbs the structure of the internal structure of the ocean. Also um, currents, the interaction of these of this currents with topography, for example. So this is actually something that's uh, very well studied, very well, and well known in the ocean, but also in the atmosphere. And to have an idea, these internal waves can have amplitudes of more than 50, 100 meters. And they propagate in all directions. And uh, yeah, they have interesting specs, let's say, such as that the, um, their phase velocity and their group velocity are, are uh, perpendicular to each other. So just to, to have an idea of, of the complexity of these waves. So it's, um, so it's also challenging to see them in, a, in the one dimensional view that we have with, with us. But also important to say that the, these waves are important for a lot of processes in the ocean, for mixing, exchange of heat and, and other substances. So for, for oceanography, they are quite relevant. So then um, a bit back on the, in, in the analysis, um, we, we have the, the chance to study data from a thermistor chain, which is basically something like to see here. It's a, it's a line uh, having a lot of uh, 
thermometers and uh, it's deployed vertically in the water. It was um, about um, four kilometers away from, from the, cl the closest part of, of, of the cable. But um, then when we compare the data from several of these sensors, which are dashed here in this, in this diagram, and we compare it with uh, one of the dash channels that was closest and also would have had the, the best correlation here. And then you, you can see some degree of yeah, consistency between both time series. If you go deeper, it means if you use some sensors that were deployed a bit deeper, 20 to 30 kilometers, you start to see a better correlation. And then for the deepest sensors, you see yeah, at least that the, the general trend is uh, quite consistent. We don't expect them to be completely uh, consistent everywhere because of uh, the, the separation, which is about four kilometers. So um, if you just plot two of these uh, time series uh, for the dust channel in red, and uh, one of the, the temperature sensors um, here in blue, and you can see a bit better the match. Sometimes there are events, specific events that match um, yeah, quite, quite remarkably. And the interesting thing about this is to see that uh, at the end of the, the observation the experiment, you can see how um, the temperature is increasing. You can see also this uh, with these isotherms here in the background. You see that the, the water is uh, it's turning more homogeneous and, and it's getting colder. And at the same time, you just obtained from a model that's um, operated for, for this region, a wind model here uh, in this in this plot below. You can see that some, there are some north uh, westerly winds, uh, a major event happening on, on the same days. And uh, it's actually known that uh, this type of winds are related to, to mistral, mistral winds in the region, which are very well known, very well studied. So this type of winds are known to be a, um, one of the causes for upwelling. So we think that we are observing this, this kind of, um, of processes in which uh, yeah, winds basically blowing over a region. It's creating, um, let's say, an empty space, so to say, which is being then uh, Filled by uh, cold water from from a deeper region, so it's um, um very also very well studied phenomenon and has a lot of complications on on the, the fish supply, for example, or um, the effects that uh, it can has on on marine marine ecosystem because of the transfer of nutrients, and also on the climate itself because it can create uh, regions where it, it rains more. And so usually when there's a really willing regions, you have also regions where on land regions where there's uh, some dry conditions or tend to be dry conditions. So it has a lot of implications. So just to summarize a bit um, some of the observations that I've shown you here. So at lower frequencies, it seems that um, ocean is, starts to dominate that signal over uh, strain, which is really what we would expect to, to measure. And the cost is, um, um, let's say, not completely clear. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of, um, it is known that uh, temperature fluctuations are, are typically slow, much slower than uh, seismoacoustic signals. Um, so this could explain it in, in some way. Um, also, because partly uh, that because of uh, at low frequencies, uh, strains uh, tend to be typically weak. So I know about uh, studies that have um, tried to detect uh, tidal signals, um, but um, they were only successful uh, applying artificial um, tidal signals that were uh, several orders of magnitude than the real tides. So it's also um, something that uh, I'm not completely sure about if it would be possible to detect this. And also because there's a tendency of the dust systems to, to increase the noise when, when you go to, to lower frequencies. Um, so um, also we see that uh, this temperature anomalies that we see, they correlate very well with the oceanographic uh, processes, such as internal waves and upwelling that we show you here. Probably there are many other oceanographic um, 
processes that you can observe with us. Um, and the, the most likely cause for this is, is that the, the local advection of seawater is um, inducing thermoptic effect on, on the fiber. That's, uh, that means it's changing the, the refractive index of the fiber. Um, as the, the, the water cools or heats up, and then, yeah, you have diffusion on the fiber itself. Um, and one important point is that, um, that these rail systems like that, they tend to have a much higher sensitivity to, temp to temperature than the Raman or the Brigeon uh, sensors. Uh, so it, we're talking about an order of magnitude that could be 1,000 times higher for gas more or less. And um, also you can achieve longer sensing ranges with us. There are been reports, uh, recent reports that I've seen um, that it may be possible to even achieve uh, measurements over the hundreds of kilometers um, without repeaters. So um, that's quite uh, encouraging. And uh, currently the DTS sensors are a bit more restricted in the sense. So the farther that you go uh, in your measurements, the more you have to average them in, in both time and, and space. So um, you, you start to lose resolution. But there are some drawbacks, of course. So um, the, the main drawback is that what we are observing here are just temperature changes with, with, with us. So we are not actually measuring absolute temperatures. So this might require some calibration, um, preferably uh, on several points on the, on the fiber. But um, actually, the TS systems, um, they also require this. So usually, you have to also calibrate them to get reliable results. Um, so yeah, it may also not be such a, um, a disadvantage in comparison to, to the TS. Um, but there's also the, the problem of potential contamination of um, other strain signals, because um, we cannot tell for sure that what we observe is purely temperature um, signal. So there might be uh, a, a chance that uh, some of what we observe is partially contaminated um, yeah, or yeah, it has some influence of, of the strain signals. Um, so just to show you an example here, this is some uh, DSTS, Bijan DSTS data in comparison to, to DAS data here above, uh, below. And uh, this is on the same cable, but was a, a different campaign. Um, yeah, for the DSTS, you can see um, a nice signal here near the shore. Um, but then if you go further offshore, you start to lose the signal. So this is uh, a couple kilometers away from the shore. But then if you look at the DAS data, you still see the same type of signal, um, um, but maybe even more detail, probably because of the higher sensitivity of the, of the, the DAS, DAS uh, sensor. But you can also see some features here below. That this, these are the same ones that I showed you before in the slope and in the, in the first uh, slides. So it may be that uh, for, yeah, this kind of um, shows uh, the, the performance of DAS against the DSTS sensor. But one, the one thing that I wanted to say about this is that um, if you look at the near, the near shore uh, recording of the DAS, you see some smearing of the signal. So um, we're still trying to understand fully what it is, but it's the same range on, on, the, on which we, we see the surface gravity waves. So it might be the case that uh, the surface gravity waves are uh, gonna affect the temperature measurements. So um, even though they are in different frequency domains, so uh, here um, we're, for temperature signals, we're talking about uh, periods of minutes to two hours, but still, um, it could be that um, the surface gravity waves may just uh, affect uh, the way that the, the fiber is behaving just uh, mechanically. Um, another interesting thing that um, um, Anthony, my, my supervisor, he uh, proposed is that maybe um, there is some seagrass in this region that might be um, affecting the signal. I'm not completely sure about this. Uh, we don't. We have not uh, go, gone too too far in, in, in that direction, but uh, that may be the case. That um, the seagrass, uh, which is called Posidonia here in the region, may be causing some 
turbulence or some effect that's uh, just uh, affecting the signal. Um, so just to, to wrap up, um, there are some challenges and opportunities for the use of DAS for measuring temperature. Um, we have to learn to, to understand the signal well. Um, this will require yeah, more correlation with other ground truths, um, and more detailed analysis. And um, also we're gonna have to take into account the, the interaction with other physical fields and the effect of the, of the variable conditions of the cable, right? the coupling, for example. But um, we think it's an opportunity to improve our, our knowledge on, on the ocean in general, not just for oceanography, but uh, also the implications that this may have for, for people interested in ocean sciences. And uh, it's also an opportunity for collaboration with, um, with this ocean science community, I think. So um, yeah, that was it from my, my side. And, Thank you very much. Anybody has any questions, comments, or <laughs> what have you? We're all ears. <laughs> awesome. Those are two fascinating talks. I have a million questions, but I'm going to leave it to others to get started. Um, and if you want to post a question in the chat, I can read it out for you, or we already have a hand raised. Takashi. Uh, yes, uh, I'm interested in the uh, Julian's uh, talk. Uh, in particular, I'm interested in the frequency band in which um, uh, high correlations between the uh, temperature and also dust measurements. So do you have any comment on that uh, frequency band? Uh, for example, one day or two day, or well, yeah, maybe uh, in particular for a longer period component. So, so you're asking about um, the frequency range in which um, you start to sense the temperature and, and then change to strain? Is that correct? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, so this is um, yeah, uh, a big question, actually. <laughs> um, but the problem is that uh, we think that this may be um, dependent on the conditions, the environmental conditions for once. Mm. So in the end, um, um, there is a, a, a rough um, frequency range that is often cited as the limit of, of the useful limit of DAS, which I think is uh, about um, 100 seconds, um, 0.01 hertz. That's usually cited. And we, we have not, um, I mean, and we, we cannot uh, still demonstrate that this frequency, you, you have a, a very um, strong shift because it may be that this, this um, border is uh, quite diffuse. So um, um, I, I can tell you a specific exact um, frequency band, but uh, it, it, it is potentially in, uh, in that range. And just um, an example from, from our data, we were able to see this temperature fluctuations up to about one millihertz. But okay. uh, we cannot oh. one millihertz, yes. Oh, but we cannot okay. discard that. You can see it even even at at, um, at um, higher frequencies. So um, it may be around there, but it's not still not clear enough. Yeah, that's interesting. Is it possible to calculate the coherency? Calibrate the coherence. Calculate coherency. Ah, um, between what? Sorry. Uh, between temperature and also dust measurement. Yeah. Yes, um, I mean, um, I didn't show results on that, but uh, yes, we can do uh, cross spectral density. Um, yes, it's something that um, I don't think we have to spend much time trying, trying to do that, but yes, it's something that we can try. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's Thank it's you. interesting. Awesome. I think uh, Megan had her hand up next. Thanks for you, to you both. Great talks. Um, I had a question. Did you do any, fil Julian, did you do any filtering of your, your temperature or your measurements of DAS to pull out those temperature signals or is it just the raw? I guess actually I did not mention this. Um, in, you could still see these patterns in the raw data, but uh, uh, for the plots that I show you, I, I had passed them. I, 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 I applied a high pass uh, just to, to highlight the, 
the, um, the fast uh, oscillations. So to get the, the best uh, image, yeah, you you probably want to to band pass or high pass. Um, yeah. Awesome, uh, Luis. Uh, yes. Um... If I may, I will make a couple of questions to uh, to Carlos. Uh, the first question is probably I misunderstood the presentation, but from the three uh, processes that uh, make tsunami to be felt by the DAS, uh, you mentioned the Poisson, the compliance, and uh, the strain from the tsunami wave. It, it looks that the strain uh, from the tsunami wave was the largest effect. If that is so, how did you compute the coupling of the water, of the movement of the water to the cable? What physical, uh, what physical model did you did you use? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't disclose the model. Yes, I agree. Uh, so right now, the uh, for the Poisson effect is just mainly uh, translating the pressure, and uh, and just the. Uh, uh, the resulting elongation of the cable. As for the compliance, uh, we took the pressure and we uh, uh, we used the, we derived that equation based on the Businesk uh, derivation for translating uh, vertical pressure to horizontal displacement of the seafloor. And then, but however, to do that translation, you, um, I'm currently using the elasticity. Uh, uh, variables from the prem model uh at the moment i haven't i haven't included uh any sort of coupling uh coefficient or constant in it so this so, is just it's... yeah but for the strain uh, for the strain between the uh the water the water wave and the and the cable that one you didn't mention are you making a one-to-one -one coupling or yeah because at the moment... I, I, sus I suspect that the water will will since okay, it has some viscosity, but we'll have to play with with several physical parameters that you didn't mention at all. So, yeah, what, um, what, what did you use for the, to getting that coupling? Yeah, so I believe you're you're talking about the the shear velocity of, yes, the, of yes. the wave propagating. Yes, yeah, there is there is a friction there is a friction coefficient being used. Uh, at the moment, I'm using a uh, derivation. Uh, let me see. It's from Tanaka, uh, from a Tanaka paper, to 2020. Uh, but at the moment, I haven't incorporated that model into into the into the graphs I showed. The graphs I showed only only account for the vertical for the vertical water water displacement. It doesn't factor in the the horizontal motion yet. That's still okay. I'm still working on that, but uh, I'm still I'm still trying to determine what the proper friction friction coefficient is to translate between stress and strain, because that's the a key parameter there, as you alluded. Uh, so it has to do a, a lot with the boundary conditions and everything. Yeah. So I'm I'm still not clear with that. Uh, definitely a work in progress. Okay, so uh, if I may, so the second question regards the usefulness of the, the, the DAS for a tsunami warn, early warning system. So we want uh, the system to identify a tsunami wave, a single tsunami wave, uh, before arriving to the coast. So we need to identify that as far as possible to the coast. Yes. Okay, so let's consider 100 kilometers. But we know that for a DAS, the signal to noise ratio degrades also with the distance to the to the interrogator so mm -hmm. uh, that is one one uh, one one concern the second concern is if uh, we are in deep waters then the, for instance if we are in 5000 meter water depth then uh, the tsunami wave will uh, arrive 7.5 minutes to the coast so you need at least half a quarter of the cycle of a tsunami wave to be uh, to be identified. So in that case, okay, it, it doesn't seem very useful for uh, shell for small for small shelf uh, coast. Right. Okay, if we put it 2,000 meters, then probably we'll have a few minutes a few minutes available 
to to give a proper uh, warning meaning identifying the severity of the of the of the tsunami in that case it will be very similar to hf radar which is also used for uh, tsunami uh, for tsunami warning but it is useful only, only for flat and long uh, shelves not not for uh, the, the shelves we have in Portugal and the, in the Portugal mainland in the islands where you have a, a, a very uh, steep uh, self uh, slope and so it, it will it will be prob probably not so so useful for in our case so this is probably the, something to think about it means yes. okay if we have it how how can it be integrated into a tsunami warning system so yes thanks, typically, thanks for Typically, my simulations, uh, I kind of uh, limit them to about 200 kilometers, which is uh, pretty much the longest, uh, 150 kilometers. That's uh, the longest uh, segment of cable that's being, that has been recorded and monitored. But uh, yes, I agree. It's, uh, it's still, it's still uh, very much in debate. I mean, what we were talking about earlier, that sheer, uh, the sheer uh, strain from the traveling tsunami wave, that is essentially negligible uh, with at the at, at um, kilometer depths. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it only becomes detectable or relevant when you're essentially at the coast. So that's a uh, yeah. that's not uh, that's not good for a detection system. So uh, yeah, at the moment it's uh, mainly looking at the vertical displacement. But that again, that also the signal that also attenuates with uh, with depth. So it's. Uh, it's a challenge, definitely. This is being tackled on both sides, both the both the simulation and the the estimation of the estimated strain signal. But uh, we're also collaborating with a university in Spain, in Alcala, where they actually uh, design a DAS instrumentation. So it's an optical group, and uh, we've been discussing about uh, techniques or means to to further improve the the noise floor. So uh, we'll see what happens. We're still hopeful. <laughs> but infragravity waves can they be used as a proxy for tsunami waves? Infragravity waves they can be quite uh, large if they quite are large. generated by uh, large storms on the on the ocean. Have you think about it about infragravity waves? Uh, it has occurred to us. Yes, uh, we're mainly focusing on the on the. Um, we're trying to essentially just isolate the the signature of a tsunami wave so essentially using the fk characteristics of a traveling tsunami wave but of course a traveling tsunami wave is also uh an enormous water mass moving along so it has a um it coincides with uh gravity waves as well so it's definitely okay. something to consider thank you Ethan, do you have another question? Yeah, um, I, thanks for a, a couple of very interesting talks. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in Carlos's case about how you're treating that Poisson effect, because you know, theoretically, the way that the Poisson's ratio is you know, usually defined in geophysics is kind of for an imaginary finite short cylindrical lab sample that you're you know, subjecting to uniaxial loading or something. And so mm -hmm. it's effectively got no confining pressure, right? In the along the uh, axial direction, and therefore is free to expand as much as possible. But in like an infinite elastic rod, um, it's fully confined, right? It's a plane strain problem, and so there can be no strain in the axial direction for radial compression. And so the cable obviously exists somewhere in between those two extremes, right? It maybe has some curvature which allows it to expand. Maybe there's some flexibility over, you know because of like a gel layer or something that allows there to be some longitudinal expansion for an applied radial compression. But, and that it's unclear to me how you model that accurately. Clearly in one sense, it could be related to the wavelength of the wave, right? It, allow, it is expanding and compressing um, in the radial direction at different points because of the characteristic wavelength and that would allow it some freedom to move in the axial direction at that same scale. but. Obviously, that is a kind of a, a nasty problem to set up. I'm curious, are you just applying this like a priori? Do you think that there's a you know better way to treat this that's actually like analytically tractable? Well, I have to admit we're using a very idealized model. So uh, it's essentially just taking the the pressure, the vertical pressure, and just uh, using the Young's modulus and the Poisson effect, uh, the Poisson ratio. 
Um, we're also using, uh, we're also implement, uh, including a, a cosine term, cosine squared term, which is uh, essentially just the angle of approach of the, of the wave with regards to the, to the, fi to the cable itself. But, uh, but yeah, that's a good point. Also just a addendum, I was thinking about similar things and, and I have two different codes that agree with each other and can compute compliance for an arbitrarily layered medium. So if you want those, let me know, I can, I can send it. Oh, I might be in touch. <laughs> Thanks, Ethan. William, did you have a question? Maybe we can end with that, end with the question. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed the talks. I had a question about sensing temperature. Most, most, I think all cables basically off the coast of the Pacific Northwest are buried to one to two meters, which I think limits their sensitivity to anything other than signals of a month or more. And I wondered whether there's a, um, a sort of low frequency limit to temperatures that you can sense with DAS or other fiber sensing technologies. I'm thinking of annual temperature variations and interannual variations. Mm, okay, um, about the, um, the degree of burial of the cable, um, um, we are not sure of how to assess this at the moment. So it may be that uh, yeah, the deeper the cable uh, is buried, then the, the more that you lose sensitivity to, to the signals. But um, we don't really have reasons to believe that um, very long-term uh, temperature variations are not going to be detected if you have a cable that's um, enough, exposed enough, let's say. So um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't. You know, yeah, I don't think of any way in which, in which um, this could be affected. Um, or yeah, it may be that um, over time, if the conditions of the cable change a lot, maybe it, over months uh, you have a cable that's uh, constantly um, being. Um, or maybe for because of landslides or something that's uh, burying the cable more, uh, then maybe you, you can have some change. But um, on the long term, I, I I don't see why this would change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we're already at five past the hour. So unless there's any other burning last questions, um, yeah, I'll just wrap it up for Hannah since she had to step it out, step out. And uh, yeah, say thanks again so much for two great talks, uh, Carlos and Julian, and um, the great discussion and questions from everyone. Um, yeah, and as Hannah mentioned at the beginning, look forward to uh, another great discussion at our next meeting in June where Hannah will be presenting.